<clears throat> so I'm Mark Carlson. I work for Toshiba. And uh, I'm presenting this on behalf of the NVM programming twig, which is working on this new cool stuff I want to tell you about. So we'll talk about some of the persistent memory technology briefly. I'm sure you've got a lot of it in this room all week. Um, and briefly cover the NVM programming model. Tom Kalpi did a really good job on that yesterday here. So maybe a slide or two. Uh, I'm not going to talk about NVDMs other than how do you secure them. And, uh, and then we'll get into persistent memory security and a threat model that we've been working on and collaborating with the Trusted Computing Group's PMEM Working Group uh, on. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the main issue is at this point, if you have an NVDM, you got to shred it when it leaves the data center. That's, that's the model that we're going by. If we can keep those NVDMs from being shredded on exit to the data center, then they'll, they'll start to be uh, you know, more conf confidence in, uh, in uh, adopting them overall, and we want to have to uh, uh, do strange things. <coughs> so persistent memory, um, <coughs> it's a type of non-volatile memory, and the, and the NVM programming model talks about persistent memory media and distinguishes it from a persistent memory access or a byte access, right? So <coughs> the media itself of persistent memory is a small circle within a larger NVM circle. And so what we're talking about is NVM, all NVM technologies. You could have a DRAM in front of NAND and that would be uh, a new uh, it's a byte accessible persistent memory, but it's not persistent memory media. Does that make sense? So uh, persistent RAM disks uh, appears as a disk to uh, applications, and it's accessed as a traditional, traditional layer of blocks. You don't have to rewrite your application to use persistent memory if you look at it like a disk. And that's how NAND got started, right? Is they, they made it into a disk. It looks like a disk and all the software just sort of works with it a lot faster. And so that's going to happen with uh, persistent memory as well. And then there's memory-like non-volatile memory. <laughs> and, and that you do access in a byte ac accessible mode. And the application is stored directly in the byte ac addressable memory. There's no I.O. or even DMA required. So we, we, we focus on persistent memory with memory kind of access, byte addressable, okay? That's the most difficult thing to secure. So the, the programming model uh, you've heard about this week, uh, nvm.pm.volume mode is, uh, uh, is, your, is your disk, looks like a disk, uh, but it's a software abstraction, and it's really landing in persistent memory. And uh, Things like address ranges and thin provisioning management you want to support. And then there's the NVM PM file mode, and this is a, a PM uh, aware file system that is uh, able to take advantage of the fact that you don't have to do I.O. for files anymore. So on per persistent memory security work in the NVM programming model, um, we want to uh, discover any gaps in the existing technologies related to PM security, and the, and the shredding of MBDIMs is a big gap. Um, but there's others. And so we're working on this threat model, and we want to suggest some requirements that could resolve some of those gaps if we did things differently, right? If we had self encrypting NVDIMs, maybe you wouldn't have to shred them. <clears throat> So we've established an alliance with the Trusted Computing Group, uh, and it's a relationship between the two groups where SNEA provides the application user level roles, behaviors, and threat models, and the TCG provides the actual solution. <laughs> and, uh, and then the TCG are also approaching uh, JEDEC. John, you're still working on that, right? Okay. So JEDEC provides those NVDIM specifications. If there's some changes that we need to do 
to uh, implement some of these uh, security features, the interface might need change as well. How do you manage NVDMs today, right? How are you going to get a secure key down into a NVDM, right? Or how do you tell it to uh, encrypt all the memory accesses that are coming in? So those are the kind of things that we need to think about. Questions so far? Okay. So many assets of security are actually unchanged by persistent memory, right? Uh, administrative security isn't changed. Uh, key management external to the device isn't changed. Memory protection isn't changed. Memory mapping isn't changed, right? Um, so the, the first order requirement that uh, I just said is can we encrypt the data at rest in an NVDIM or other persistent memory device? Um, so when you authenticate or re-authenticate, uh, you want to be able to trigger some uh, operation inside. Real-time encryption, is that even possible? Is it, is it just make these things too expensive? Um, and then there's this whole continuity of principle identity, right? If, if I'm the one that stuck the data into this NVDIM, and that, that NVDIM ends up in a different system, how, do, how does the new user of it authenticate to my data, right? I mean, you really need, if you're going to do this, you have to, to sort of think about those kind of things. Because the whole idea of a removable persistent memory component is that if the rest of the system dies, your data is still there. Right? It's, it, it's uh, you know, it's portable now. I can take it and put it in a new system and should be able to come back with all the, the features that I have. <coughs> okay? So the protection granularity is important too, and especially at the file and volume layers, right? Um, so if I, my persistent memory is showing up as a, a virtual disk uh, or partition or device, um, that's the thing that you want to uh, encrypt at rest, right, on that level of granularity. Um, but if you have a per persistent memory aware file system, now you've got memory map files and that is the granularity at which you, you may want to do some of these security features. And then achieving isolation analogous to external storage. So. Um, maybe you have a limited access enablement window where it's available um, <clears throat> over, you know, you have to make it available to the operating system via a secure mechanism. And then how do you rapidly uh, transition your privileges or escalate uh, permissions? Uh, the employee that, that put their data on the NVDIM has left the company. You don't know how it was secured, but you need his data. <clears throat> so, one of the things that we uh, uh, sort of <clears throat> focused on is this isn't really going to be a very big market unless you know the cloud guys adopt it, right? Hyperscalers adopt it. They start charging you for a virtual machine uh, that has persistent memory under it, right? And they can charge you more, yeah, but you're going to pay it because it's so much faster, right? Um, so, how, how do you establish trust in a cloud environment, in a multi-tenant environment, with these NVDIMs, right, with persistent memory? I want a, I want a machine with uh, a gigabyte of persistent memory. Um, <clears throat> what is the cloud provider going to do with my data when I'm no longer running that machine? Is it still in the persistent memory? Did he stage it off to an SSD? Or what? Right? Or is it, is it sitting out in a, a hard drive? So we want to speak to this multi-tenancy hardware support. Um, what features in the NVDIM would be required for multi-tenancy uh, cloud use, right? Or even internal private cloud use uh, uh, still in a, a virtualized environment? So both of these uh, hopefully can be addressed by the encryption at rest solution you come up with. And, uh, and think about the, the issues that we discussed on the prior two slides. So here we have <clears throat> a cloud customer, and we have a cloud data center infrastructure, right? 
there's a little key down here that says this cloud infrastructure is insecure, right? Because you got multiple people running in it. Uh, there's some security mechanism that secures this insecure environment for this customer. And then there's the, the customer secured pieces as well. So that's, that's the thing. So the cloud data centers are not necessarily trusted by the customers, right? They're, they're, their competitors could have their stuff running in that same cloud, right? Um, <clears throat> so customer establishes an account, he becomes a tenant, uh, he's running an application in, in an isolated uh, container or VM, and now that application securely mounts some piece of storage, uh, persistent memory that is isolated, hopefully, from other, other clients in, in that cloud, right? And then the customer manages and uses keys uh, to secure his own use of all of that. And typically that would be an external key manager. Uh, and, and here, the customer, customer's keys are in a piece of customer-managed infrastructure, so he trusts it, right? Um, there's other scenarios where the cloud is, the provider is providing the key management, but that, that it has its own issues. We didn't go there. So uh, per per persistent management clone use case. And this is, this is uh, you want to boot a machine, but you want to boot it from a golden Linux image, right? So you have this boot image here that uh, you want to make actually immutable. You don't want anybody going in and changing the gold Linux in image for every customer, right? Um, <clears throat> so basically what you want to do is to instantiate your app, you actually do a copy on write uh, to, to the machine that's running there, and, and at that point it can change because it's running now, but this never changes, right? So the, the PM boot image is this trusted gold standards. It's immutable. Uh, and then the tenant runs in clones of that boot image. And writes only happen over here. They don't ha happen over here. And then you can add additional security features, such as digital signature. You sign this image, right? A lot of them do. And before you trust it to run in your cloud, you, you verify that signature. Uh, immutability is ensured by the cloud provider enforced by features of the iOS of the op operating system and the memory controller and perhaps maybe even the NVDM. The storage access is authorized based on the customer provided keys that we talked about on the last image. So it's mounted after the image creations and then becomes part of that tenant environment. Questions so far? Okay. So what are the features of a multi-tenant infrastructure? You have this isolated execution environment for customer applications. The customer provides a key to enable the execution. And uh, you may have many execution environments per customer, right? The whole idea is you can scale these things out to address the, the needs of your own customers, right? Um, <clears throat> so the, secure, the access to cloud storage is already secured. Uh, customer provides a key to access those files and objects. Typically, it's uh, like an X509 certificate in most of these interfaces. Uh, <clears throat> and again, where you store your, your data in the cloud storage is, also has many different locations, or um, uh, buckets, some of these interfaces call it. And then per tenant, you have a storage volume of partitions. And, uh, and you want to be able to enable the secure erase of the deleted data. So we're talking about something around, something on the order of 10 keys per drive, maybe. I don't know. Depends on how big, big, big the drive is. Um, <clears throat> so both persistent and non-persistent storage usage uh, has to be taken into account. And then the uh, storage systems partitions themselves are not necessarily attaining cloud scale. You don't need access by thousands of machines usually. So 
if you think about what's on, on the disk, it, it actually has, uh, uh, there's two classes of tenants. One is a tenant who, re uh, who relies on the security and the granularity of the uh, cloud provider to secure each little piece of data, right? The other is tenants who achieve data security using the provided uh, the provider supported hardware secure race uh, features. Though that ends up into a, a partition tenant mapping here that then gets laid out on different pieces of storage or, or persistent memory. So as far as, as this is concerned, these are all shared amongst the different uh, tenants and it's only other infrastructure above the actual storage uh, persistent memory thing that that uh, actually gives you security and the granularity. Now, if you're trusting on the NVDIM to provide the, the actual security features in hardware, then uh, it's a different uh, partition mapping. Questions on this? Okay. So, key management is necessary. Uh, the secure key management techniques applied, to, including the use of key encryption keys, which is a keychain kind of technology. Um, <clears throat> and then any retention of the un unencrypted data that is in the process of being encrypted or scheduled for the same must be guaranteed to re un be unrecoverable after any event that can compromise security, such as power loss, reset, or component renewal. But this is the same thing we've been doing for disk drives for years, right? SSDs. Right? But it's a different interface now. You're talking about byte addressable on the memory bus. So there's standards out there already. Oasis uh, KMIP is a key management uh, interoperability protocol, I believe. Have you seen a single memory bus that makes it byte addressable? All the ones I know were the ones. When it actually gets out to the device, <laughs> <laughs> I have to use Andy's flush command. <laughs> Uh, the other the other thing is auditing. You, yeah, it's great to say this, but unless you provide the right uh, features of a, a, an event, a security event, there's no place to log it, right? So part of this is actually logging the security operations that are done on the actual NVDIM itself and, and providing the hooks uh, so that you can find out who accessed what part of the NVDIM when Right? And, and who gave them permission and those kind of things, right? <clears throat> Other considerations include the uh, code origin and delivery production. Uh, I mentioned the signing of the, the, uh, the images, but maybe you also sign any other piece of thing that you want to trust. <clears throat> so obviously executable. But uh, there's also uh, non-repudiation, which means you know definitely it came from your boss. And, and it's not a spoof email that's trying to get you to download malware or something, right? So that's non-repudiation. But it also uses encryption. Now, on, on the subject of memory protection, memory protection is primarily an OS process-centric uh, idea. One can view those virtual machines as processes run on hypervisors. Containers, they are what? They are. Yeah. <laughs> All applications run in one or more processes. Memory management units enforce memory protection using both virtual address space mapping and physical address protection. And, and details of the both of those are dependent upon which MMU are you running. So, <clears throat> What are the security implications of that as well? So you can see we're sort of just exploring all these different use cases, understanding what the requirements are so that we can work with the TCG group and the JEDEC group to, to come up with some uh, solutions here pretty soon. And it's all part of the NVM programming model for sure. So <clears throat> we have a, a threat model and to introduce you to that, we've uh, come up with different roles uh, to use in describing the threat model. So uh, we have a term called customer. This is the security principal or data owner, person or organization. So that's the customer. 
There's a developer, which might be a storage application developer, DevOps, whatever. He's using the libraries uh, and so forth. And then there's a security officer, right? Not only assigning rights, but running the audits and, and uh, engaging external auditing uh, companies and so forth. And then there's an administrator, the, the guy that does system configuration manager. And the reason we say that's insecure is because he doesn't own the data. He's responsible to manage the infrastructure, but he shouldn't have access to the data. And then there's you know deliverers and repairers and factory channel support and supply chain. And I want to be able to send these NVDMs back to the manufacturer if they fail. Uh, I want to be able to sell them on eBay. Okay? So, uh, threat model is a bit of an eye chart, but um, uh, we have kind of a category of attack, and, and we'll show those. Uh, within, let's say, cross tenant, there's, there's aspects like uh, privacy and confidentiality, integrity, availability. Uh, denial of service attacks, for example. So then we say, who's the attacker? And remember, the previous slide had the roles. So uh, in the cross-tenant privacy confidentiality threat, the attacker would be a, a tenant administrator or a repair. And the approach that we take, uh, sorry, this is all white text. This is applicable existing approach and new issues with persistent memory, right? So if we say none here, we haven't identified any holes, if you will, that persistent memory has opened up. Okay, But we want to still document those so that at least it shows that we consider it. Right. So traditional authorization, authentication, encryption at rest, separation of roles, and memory protection are all in this uh, cross-tenant privacy and confidential the OS, the hypervisor takes pretty much uh, care of those already. Persistent memory doesn't issue, uh, create any new issues in those things. Uh, integrity, cross-tenant integrity, um, developer, tenant, administrators. The uh, existing approach is a traditional author auth authorization, authentication, the separation of roles, and the memory protection. Now, there is, in the per persistent memory case, an increased scope of damage due to mismanaged pointers, memory resources, and so forth. If I, if I say in my persistent memory, I save a pointer. How, good, how long is that pointer good for? Not very long. But it's persistent now. It doesn't go away when the machine dies. <laughs> uh, availability, denial of service, uh, both to the tenant and the developer. Uh, in order to do uh, availability, you, you sign a contract with the, the cloud provider, perhaps. Um, but uh, the per tenant quality of service that uh, is existing might be disrupted uh, by a potential for rapid disruption with limited detection window uh, in the persistent memory case. Uh, in the uh, cross tenant, yeah. I think that's a bug. <laughs> but uh, so, uh, applicable existing approach is secure erasure, physical or cryptographic during deletion, and more rapid free space recycling in memory rather than disk, right? Because you're going you're to move stuff in and out of, of persistent memory quite, quite often, uh, either, especially as, the, as you initially put these things in, it's going to be a small piece of persistent memory that accelerates the rest of the stuff. It's very expensive per byte. Uh, so then there's a category called insider, should be obvious. Uh, local hardware attacks, uh, like from a DMA engine perhaps. Uh, and for memory protection and per tenant quality of service applied to I.O., um, we're starting to think about this. We, we haven't said there's no issues, but uh, we haven't identified any specific ones. Uh, RDMA. Is RDMA a threat to persistent memory, right? If you're RDMA into here, how is that secure? Um, and there are, there are ways to secure RDMA, but 
it's not a matter of protecting the data that's going in so much as who put it in there. How did, how did they have permission to put it in there, right? So if you're doing persistent memory over fabrics, what's the security uh, threat model around that, right? So, so we're thinking about that as well. And then uh, there's uh, malware, right? Uh, Insider delivers malware into the system. Uh, digital signing, virus protection are already there. I don't think, I don't think persistent memory adds anything or, or opens up any holes. Um, and then, you know, access by admin and support, getting in there and see their tenant stat data. Um, and how do, you, how do you actually assure their customers that your administrators can't see their data? All right, so that's, that's where we've gotten so far. We're working on a white paper. Um, <clears throat> and it will detail all of this. We, we did an early, earlier draft that just had that threat model in it and sent it over to TCG. Uh, so we'll be updating that. We have a, a new version. We didn't get it out publicly in time for this conference yet. Um, but we'll, in the next week or two, we'll probably have it out there. Um, so how do, you, how do you control the security features of persistent memories and NVDIMs? Is, for example, they're an area of that NVDIM that's reserved for the control. Now, this wouldn't require JEDEC to do anything, right? We just say this little piece of memory is the sort of hypervisor, supervisor area of memory. The tenants don't get to write to it. But you go in and write to this reserved area, that gives you the, you know, assign this granularity, map that granularity, this tenant has access to that, and this other tenant doesn't. Um, so that's one possible thing that we might work on uh, with TCG around. What about IOCTL support for supporting a, a root of trust? Um, you'd have to reestablish that root of trust on, on a power event, uh, reset, hot plug, and heartbeat loss. And then uh, another idea is shadowing of a volatile area, DRAM, um, with persistent memory backing store. So maybe your DRAM, the app's writing in clear, right? But when you send it off to the NAND in the DIM, it becomes encrypted. So, that's, that's the CPU. You have to support it in the CPU. Yeah, yeah, and then you have to put it in the memory controller. And uh, if you can do that at memory speeds, that's pretty good. Thank you. Yeah. Is that the Ryzen? Well, that whole family. Yeah. No, we just have to standardize your memory controller. All that stuff, you're like at Uh, so, so yes, we're, we're still working on this. Uh, it's not done yet. Uh, we're, we're looking for input. If you have feedback, uh, send us a feedback. Uh, but we really want to rally the industry around uh, this NIA view of persistent memory. Uh, people are starting to use it in NVMe now uh, with some of the TPARs that are coming forward and mentioning that. Uh, so we have uh, application-centric, Vendor neutral, it's achievable today. Uh, and it goes beyond just storage. Applications, memory, networking, processors all need to think about how they are affected by persistent memory. Like we had this panel this morning, right? How are the fabrics going to be affected? How are the SSDs going to be affected by persistent memory? Um, NVMe just uh, approved, I think, uh, persistent memory regions. Uh, and and that, that'll uh, see some more features over the, year, over the next few months. And um, actually, this, it's not up there yet, but, but that's where it will land when we finally uh, publicize it. The programming model, uh, the latest programming model, version 1.2, I encourage you to go download it, read it, understand it. Uh, uh, go get the slides from Andy's talk as well. All right. Ooh, we're doing good for the pool. <laughs> so you guys aren't very interactive. So anybody have any uh, questions or Let's comments? Let's get on to the drinks, then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you just, you look like the 
table? Sure. There's three slides of table. If, 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 what is the scope of what you guys are doing? Right, but, but what's the security model for memory? No, volatile memory. memory. So, the, yes. but, so you should drop persistent from the title. No, no but there, there's features when memory becomes persistent that now, I mean, nobody shreds their DRAM chips when they leave the data center, do they? Um, they're forgettable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, 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 I'm just saying that a lot of the things that you're talking about, a lot of the things that you're talking about here, does that really even apply to the existing DRAM as well? Well, we, if, if that was truly the case, we'd have none down all the columns. No, it's not all of them. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've listed and go to the next slide and the next. There's yeah. a slide that has blank. Yeah, slide. if it's blank, <laughs> if it's blank, that means we, we, we can't it's agree that it's mean, none. Right? <laughs> Maybe we just haven't found one yet. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. This is an exercise left to the reader, I see. No, it's, it's between the, the groups that are working on this stuff, right? We send this over the wall to TCG. They say, no way, you forgot about this. Yeah. Well, now we've heard much about it, uh, but knowing a lot about SED and FDE, will we have an equivalent for the solid state devices? You know, yes, it's a race. It's protect a limited amount. It's only for device port. Yeah, you can sec secure erase a single namespace and then you mean. I don't know, is it supporting Linux? Secure erase of a single namespace? Well, it's supported if the device does it, right? I mean, if you look at it, you mean, well, we've got the new security model, which is what we're talking about here, and then we've got the security model, which is what we're talking about here, He's right over there. It gets fundamentally odd when you're dealing with man and its erase structures and moving things in the background because we don't really control what's used. No, 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 no. that's not the problem. That's very understandable. The problem with NDE is... No, I, I understand that. I'm getting there. And when you have configurable namespaces and you have different areas of the device, sometimes you can build architectures which separate that. But it's more typical that you don't because then you get the best square leveling, you can get the best performance, there's trade-offs. So it's easier if we sanitize the whole device and you know what you're getting from your sanitizer. You can guarantee it. No, no, it absolutely is. I mean, the, the point is if you look at Permit NVM, the one option, the most common one, isn't even it's a crypto race, so you just throw away the key, not the data. But the, the point is, the interface is designed in the NDE is the worst possible one. Any sane person would say, there's a format namespace that's an optional command, and a format subsystem that's an optional command. Not one command that always takes a namespace ID and sometimes ignores it. <laughs> well, it's generally acknowledged that the higher you go in the, in the hierarchy, the higher up you are. Yeah. So if you can move from the device level, you know, that FDE provided, for example, you can move up to the subsystem layer and do it the storage controller, okay. you're a lot better off, like the example with the StoreWise software base. Sure. If you can move up to the OX level, like Z uh, encryption, the ZOS encryption facility, you're even better because now you're protected in flight. If you can move up to source data creation at the top of the heart, you're actually at the best level, but there's other issues involved. None of these are freebies, by the way, we have found out. It's, there's a price to pay at each level, obviously. But when you're talking in data rest and leaving stuff behind, which is what happens with the crypto scramble, anybody, anybody, everybody with their quantum computer can break that stuff. So sometimes you actually do want to do block erases, you want to do overwrites, stuff like that. And to do that well, you need to do it all, or you don't really know that you've done it. So if I have a 
FIPS 140-2 certified uh, uh, operating system level encryption capability built into my OS. Is that, you're saying that's easily, anyone can crash that? There's a reason that there's a post quantum uh, NIST <laughs> process in place right now to figure out how to do encryption once you know about quantum computing. You better be careful, you better warn a lot of people sleep tonight. Sorry. <laughs> so it goes. By the way, <laughs> Trump has nothing to do with it. <laughs> All right. So the front. <laughs> so Eden, Eden is talking. Yeah, uh, Sne no, no, Sne Snea already has a, uh, a really good handle on the, the security ciphers to use. Uh, we, have, we have a TLS spec, which, which actually scopes TLS down into uh, only a handful of ciphers, cipher suites that are used in that. Uh, so I imagine that we would recommend uh, similar kind of cipher suites as well for, for this. You know, TLS has speci specified uh, all these uh, AES, uh, 256, you know. It, yeah, 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 I understand. Yeah. For example, the common, the cool. common one for NVMe, for SSDs, is AES-XTS, which, which, which is built upon a, a sector-level encryption. Yeah. Now it's not the sector, right? It's a, you can modify one byte. Well, that's the other way around, right? AES does with 128 bits. We had to do something special to extend the whole block. Well, yeah. well, but if you, but said, if you want to do a byte, you well, 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 really. Who <laughs> says the byte or the, the, the block or the, the cache line is even the encryption block size? Because if you look at the OS memory management, well, it's mostly page size space. It would be really nice around number to use per K as your encryption uh, block. Another fun side of that is latency. So if you're going to have some inline encryption, you don't want to have six million gates to deal with that. You have a limitation by how big you can make it. I like that. I like the requirements that the memory has. Well, I mean, gate encryption units. Yeah, I was going to say, well, storage uh, device uh, this is right. a right. 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 And then the other, the yeah, other thing about our one's cache line size is cache line sizes aren't the same everywhere. There's power systems out there that have 128 by cache lines. There are our arm systems. size is not a standardized value, right? So you need to build, so your crypto needs to think of the idea that your media might be moving between systems with different headquarters. But as long as you're multiple at 128 bits, you're kind of okay. So, so one thing that's different is when you move something in the block space, stuff sort of moves, and you expect it to move, and it goes from some either one nice collection of zero to n, or several nice collections of zero to n. But in the NVDIM memory mode, it's just different. And that's where the at rest stuff is kind of interesting, because when you're moving in NVDIM, you probably don't want to move the contents, period. Well, I mean, the, I, I, I don't understand. I haven't why seen one use model for that. I don't understand why everyone is so He's focused. Uh, I, yeah, I don't, I don't see why everyone's so focused on NVDIM. I mean, to be honest, uh, a storage like semantic of a parallel memory bus that is synchronous is freaking stupid. So we initially we'll see things like NVMe TMR because that reduces PCIe. Eventually we'll move to asynchronous operations of memory bus. JEDEC is already working on that. Eventually, not too soon, we'll move to serial memory memory connections because the parallel bus just isn't on scale with data rates anymore. So I don't think people should, uh, should be worried too much about the the memory model. Is the memory serial memory? Huh? It's rescaling to be parallel with the high speed serials. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll so, make a bad that so we've seen, a so we've seen persistent memory media show up in block device, right? That's where Octane lives, or 3D trust point, right? I mean, the whole point is people are trying to play up.
But if you put an NVMe device, all those issues go away. It's an NVMe device, right? No, but I mean, I could build a cache controller right now that does loads and stores to an NVMe device. It's sure. all about the cache controller, right? Yeah. So it doesn't really matter how your bus connection is looking like it's a programming model. Right. Well, yeah, exactly. It's actually the same thing. You could, but it's not going to be that easy. But fundamentally, memory generally doesn't have a driver. That's, no, it has now with persistent memory. Look at how much proper code we have to drive a Venus. Those, those days are over. Look well, at Gen Z. We, yeah, we'll, we'll end up hopefully removing a lot of that stuff. Guys, we just move it up to the OS level. Yeah. The whole discussion's irrelevant. <laughs> right? Are you still shredding NVM, NVDMs, and perhaps NVMe devices with persistent media in them before they leave the, the factory? The other, I'm sorry, I'm the other advantage we get is, you know, there's a lot of interest in key shredding, and, and we have customers that have done it thousands of times, and continue to do it dozens of times every day. Uh, and the reason that's of such interest is, number one, you don't want to leave stuff behind. Number two, if you have an intrusion detection, you've got to shut the door real quick. And it's a lot quicker to shred the keys than it is to overwrite devices, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the advantages of moving up the hierarchy and getting at the OS level is I can shred the keys in nanoseconds. Yeah. Okay? And if I can shred the master keys at that level, man, I'm uh, <laughs> what the rest. This is an interesting discussion. Don't get me wrong. Okay. But it doesn't matter after that, right? Yeah. So, yeah. But with, with the crypto scramble, Unfortunately, it'll take you a microsecond if it's in the device. Live with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other discussion, questions? Sorry for the folks on the video podcast when it comes out. We just had a long, interactive discussion without microphones. <laughs> Thanks, guys.